He has satisfied the judgment of God and released the power for divine giving. But even though it has been fully paid for, many still have no knowledge on how to assess divine giving. And so many are sick. And sometimes the doctors, even though they are doing their best, may not be able to help. Because there are still sicknesses without cure. So this morning we want to focus on how to receive divine healing. Amen. Divine healing is the restoration of health to a creature, place, or thing through the supernatural intervention of God. Health is its condition of being sound in mind body or spirit. So when there is the absence of sickness, diseases, or malfunction of the body system, you say an individual is healthy because the person is in a state or condition where he or she found soundness, wholeness in body, mind, and spirit. So when God restores health to a creature, to a place or a thing through his supernatural intervention, it is called divine healing. Now that's different from cures that doctors try to make happen using drugs to balance hormones, to provide what is deficient in the body so that the systems can recuperate and function effectively. So when God heals, he does it supernaturally. And healing had already been occurring on planet Earth even before Jesus came. Hope you know that. That before Jesus came, there was already healing taking place. The reason why the children of Israel lived in health was because every time that sickness came calling, God was there to heal them. When God healed, the house of Abimelech, do you remember? When he took Abraham's wife, and God, the Bible says, God closed the womb of all his wives, and God eventually healed his house, there was no drug taking. Do you understand that? I'm not against taking drugs, but you can receive supernatural healing by the workings of God. In Exodus, Chapter 15, verse 26. The Bible says, And said, If you diligently hear the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandment and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptian. For I am the Lord who heals you. Amen. Now, that does not mean that God afflicts his children with sickness or teaches them to mature with sickness. God doesn't do that. Do you understand that? When we sin, disobey God, when we live unrighteously, we step out of God's protective covering over our lives. And we expose ourselves to sicknesses and disease and attack of the enemy. As long as you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, you'll be protected. And if there, by any means there's an attack on your health, you can call on God as long as you are in line with His will, obey His word, and please in Him, He will make you whole. Glory to God. When a messenger of Satan was sent to buffet Saul, Saul recorded, he said, because of the multitude of the revelation that was given to him. The abundance of the revelation. He said, at least I be exalted above measure. In other words, he was already being exalted. Even Peter testified and said, you know, God is really speaking to that brother Paul. The things he's explaining about the New Testament church, the new birth, they can only be taught by God. You know, he said, Jesus met him and taught him by revelation. So, pride was already setting in. You know, there's something about us humans that when God lifts you, 
is walking miracle signs and wonders through you, you seem to just develop some, some extra shoulder parts on your shoulder. Your head just begins to swell. And you sometimes begin to think that uh, things are happening because of you, who you are, or you have fasted and prayed and so God. So God had to permit that an infirmity, a weakness, be given to Paul to keep him in touch with humanity so that himself will still remember that and be human being. A man who handkerchiefs and aprons that came in touch with his body drove out demons. Healed sicknesses and disease. Uh, that's awesome, my dear. That's power. The demons see an handkerchief that touch your body and they run away. That's power. So most times when people say God has afflicted them with sicknesses or disease, it's not so. He doesn't do so. Many times they step out of the protective covering of God. In John chapter 5, after the man who was lame was healed by the um, ship gate, by the pool of Bethsaida, the Bible says when Jesus found him, he says, see you have been made whole. Make sure you do what you see no more. At least a worse thing happen to you. So many times sin, doubts, fear opens the door to sicknesses and affliction. But the good news is that God can heal anything or anyone. Divine healing includes the healing of anything or anyone. Bad water and barren ground were healed by God through the ministry of Elisha. In the book of 2 Kings chapter 2 from verse 19 to 22, they met with Elisha just after he had received a double portion of the anointing on Elijah. And they said to him, the men of the city, in verse 19 of 2 Kings chapter 2, he says, Then the men of the city said to Elijah, Please notice the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees. But the water is bad, and the ground is burning. As a result of the curse that Joshua placed on Jericho, even though Jahel in the days of King Hera built the city and set up the foundation by his firstborn and the gate by his last son, the curse still brought affliction and barrenness and death upon that same land of Jericho. But a man came by the double portion of the anointing of the Holy Spirit and through him, through the ministry of Elijah, God took away death, barrenness in the land. I don't know what you are going through. Maybe your land is barren. Your business is not productive. Maybe like Peter, you have toyed all night and caught nothing. Nothing is working. Today, God will make everything whole in the mighty name of Jesus. Yeah. And also, if death has been plaguing your family or plaguing that which consigns you, today life will come to it in the mighty name of Jesus. Yeah. Verse 20 he said, Then he went out to the source of the water. And, okay, sorry, verse 20 says, And he said, Bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. And verse 21 he says, Then he went out to the source of the water and cast in the salt there and said, Thus says the Lord. So it's God that is working this miracle. Can you see that? Thus says the Lord. I have healed this water, from it there shall be no more death or barrenness. Look at verse 22, it says, So the water remains healed to this day according to the word which Elisha had spoken. Praise God. So it was God that walked the healing. So before Jesus came, God was already walking healings. Glory to God. But what Jesus came to do is to make the healing available to all. Because in those days, God healed those he wanted to heal. Whoever he was pleased to be healing or caught by the sovereign act of God. And God could walk the healing through whoever he wants to use. That's why when Jesus got to the uh, pool of Bethsaida, he only healed one man. 
And yet there were multitudes of people who were healed there. But he only healed one man because that was the one person God wanted to heal. The man has been there for 38 years. So God looked upon him with mercy and God sent Jesus to go heal him. Just like he sent Ananias to go heal Paul of Tarsus. And the blind scale went off his eyes. So that Jesus has come to make divine healing available to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. Glory to God. The stripes and wounds that Jesus bore on his body purchased divine healing for all creation forever. Let me read from Isaiah chapter 53, from verse 4 to 5, the Amplified Version. It says, Surely he has borne our grief, sicknesses, weaknesses, and distresses. Sicknesses, weaknesses, and distresses. And not only that, and carried our sorrows and pain. So whatever is bringing sickness, distress, affliction, sorrow, pain, Jesus has taken care of them all. Glory to God. He carried our sorrows and pain of punishment, yet we ignorantly consider him stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God, as if with leprosy. Verse 5 says that he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities, for our guilt, and the iniquities, and he says the chastisement needful to obtain peace and well-being for us was upon him and with the stripes that wounded that blow that cuts him with the stripes he says he we are healed and made whole praise jesus now i want you to note what i'm about to say to you so that you understand what this passage is talking about he said, the sacrifice of Jesus satisfies God's judgment against mankind and obtain, amongst other things, the release of the power for divine healing. So when Jesus was caught with blows, when Jesus received those stripes by being flogged with weeds that had sharp instruments and objects like pins so that each time the whip came upon Jesus as they removed it they were scars, they were wounds, they were bleeding. Now when he went through that, he wasn't going through it to appease the devil so that the devil would no longer afflict man with sicknesses. He did that to redeem man from eternal condemnation. from the judgment of God. It wasn't certain that condemned man to eternal condemnation. It wasn't certain that judged man. It was God. On account of man's disobedience, remember after Adam sinned against God with Eve, God pronounced judgment on mankind. Man was condemned to eternal condemnation. And so because of that, the glory and the protective covering of God left man. Death was in the earth before them, but death never killed anybody. But the moment the glory departed, the presence of God, God left man alone because man has choose to go his own way, so God had to leave him alone. Fear came. Death came. Sicknesses came. Affliction came. Suffering came. And every evil you can think of came into the earth to man and began to afflict man. So now in order to get man back to the presence of God, to the garden of God, the Eden of God, somebody will have to suffer the consequences of man's sin. Now because everyone has been condemned, everyone was supposed to suffer the consequence of sin. Then Jesus became our scapegoat. Jesus became our sacrificial lamb. 
Jesus became our ransom, the price that was paid for our redemption. So that just like Jesus had suffered for our sins, bore the stripes, it will be accounted that each one of us has also suffered. That's why when we were baptized into him, we died with him. And when he is resurrected, we are resurrected to newness of life. If we are traveling to another nation and I pay your fare and you get your boarding pass, when you get to the airport and they ask you, have you paid your fare? You say yes. Why? Because it has been paid for you. If we go for a book fair in a restaurant and I pay your fair, your, 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 your feeding fee, now you don't need to pay again because it has been paid for. So if you take your plate and you go about enjoying yourself from one train to another and somebody comes and says, or maybe the, the waitress says, what are you doing? He says, I've paid. My fare has been paid. Now that was exactly what Jesus did for us. Now, with the devil, because we have been redeemed by sacrifice, he has satisfied the judgment of God, but yet was still being held captive by the devil. What he did with Satan was not going to die to appease the devil, or to go back to Satan and say, please, these people have redeemed them. God's judgment has been satisfied. Please let them go. Leave them. Give them to me. No. What he did was to spoil principalities and powers. He led captivity or captive. Colossians 2.15 Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them, triumphing over them openly in it. So, the Bible records that because we are humans and subject to fear of death. He through death destroyed him who had the power of death so that through it he might deliver those who through all their lifetime were subject to the devil because of fear of death. So having appeased God's judgment and punishment and redeemed us from the eternal condemnation sentenced by God, he came to the devil and death with him and heavy blow. Do you understand that? Because he himself was taken captive and was in hell for three days and three nights. While his blood ascended to the mercy seat in heaven. And almighty God kept quiet for three days and three nights. I imagine that heaven stood at attention. Watching. For the first time the son was alone. Without the father, without the Holy Spirit. Just all alone. But he trusted that they would come for him. On the third day when the father turned to look at the son. You know, he had turned his face away for three days. Because Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why has that one forsaken me? Hello, hello, lama sabatani. But after three days, he turned his face to look towards hell. And when he did, the Bible said, God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. Glory to God. Not that he shined light into darkness. He commanded light to shine out of darkness. When he turned his face, the glory, the power, the grace of God, the Spirit of God came and invaded the hell through Jesus. And Satan and his cohort fell that prostrate. And he took them and matched them for all to see that he has triumphed over them. That's why I said all authority in the heaven and on earth has been what? Given to me. Above, on the earth, beneath the earth. So when we use his name, demons have to tremble because he had won the victory over them. Hallelujah. So we don't go to the devil to beg the devil that he'll let us alone so that we can be healed. We exercise our authority and say, you better get off here. And you have to go because he knows Jesus has paid the price and he knows he has been defeated. He has no authority over you any longer. So if you have this understanding, you shouldn't be afraid of the devil afflicting you with sickness or disease. And you should be assured also that the price for your healing has been fully paid for. So if you are sick, it's your fault. It is what? Your fault. Glory to God. So the power for divine healing has been released by the sacrifice of Jesus. In Acts chapter 10 verse 13, the Bible says, How that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. He says, For God was 
with him. The act of divine healing is effected by God's power. The act of divine healing is effected by God's power. If there is no power of God at work, there can't be healing. No power, no healing. It's just like if you don't have data or data connection, you can't solve the web. You can connect to the internet. It takes data to connect to the internet. Even though the connection is already there, it is the data that gives you access to solve the web. It is the data that gives you access to connect online. So in like manner, it is the power of God that gives you access to divine healing. Once that power is present, then you can assess divine healing. In the book of Luke chapter 5 verse 17, the Bible says, Now it happened on a certain day, Luke 5 verse 17, Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. He says, And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. I like that. The power of the Lord was what? Present to heal them. And if you read the book of Matthew 10 verse 1, he called his disciples to himself and he gave them power over unclean spirit and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. So all kinds of sicknesses and diseases answer to the power of God. When that power is present, sicknesses and diseases must go. Glory to God. Now, there are different methods through which this power can be assessed. And that is what I really want to spend time on. I have seven methods noted for divine healing, but I want us to look at three very quickly. Three ways through which you can assess divine healing anytime, any day. That if you will identify with these three methods, you be sure you believe. And I'll give you examples from scripture. Glory to God. First and foremost, I'd like us to look at God's mercy. Obtaining divine healing by God's mercy. God is the father of mercies. And all that we receive from him comes to us on the basis of his mercy. You know, I learned this the hard way years ago. When we came to Lagos with my family and we needed to get an apartment, what we had was not enough. And I fasted and prayed and cried to God and nothing was working. No funds was forthcoming. Thank God for a dear family who took us in and minister to us sumptuously every day, care for us. May the Lord bless them richly in Jesus' name. Amen. But you know, I wanted the place of our home. And so one day, I went to the church to go seek the Lord for some days. And the Lord said to me, because you live right, it's not a guarantee that I will, I will answer you every time you call. I will answer you on the basis of my mercy. And so I learned a new dimension about mercy. And even the moment I cried on the basis of his mercy, resources came. The rent was paid. So everything we receive comes through Jesus, but on the basis of his mercy. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, I want to read from the Amplified Version. Listen. It says, Let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace. I like that. You know, New King James says, Let us therefore boldly come. Let us therefore boldly come. But and the Bible says, let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near, glory to God, to the throne of grace, 
The throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners, that we may receive mercy for our failures and find grace to help a good time for every need, appropriate help, and well-timed help coming just when we need it. Glory to God. Coming just when we need it. And the help is well-timed and is appropriate. And it's coming just when we need it. So it can never be too late. Tell somebody, God can never be too late. Let's see some examples in scripture. A great multitude who followed Jesus from the cities to the desert received healing by the mercy of God. You find that in the book of Matthew chapter 14 verse 14. The Bible says in Matthew 14 verse 14 it says, And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude. A great multitude. Hundreds of thousands if not millions. And the Bible says, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. That was that. The compassion of God. The mercy of God. Remember that these individuals are not born again. Jesus had not yet risen from the grave. Nobody was saved. But the mercy of God brought healing to a great multitude. So every time we obtain mercy, we can quickly assess the healing of God. And this is readily available to all those who are not saved. Now, see people who are not born again and you pray for them, they get healed. My mom once asked me to pray for one of our goats. The goat was sick. <laughs> and I laid my hands and prayed that the Lord healed the goat. As an animal, the mercy of God, so awesome, so awesome that even those who do not believe can assess healing by the mercy of God. Also, a labor received divine healing by obtaining mercy from Jesus in the book of Mark chapter 1 from verse 40 to 42. Mark chapter 1 from verse 40 to 42. He says, now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion. I like that. You see, the anointing of the Spirit of God responds always to compassion. Anytime you want to operate in the giftings of the Spirit and you can assess compassion, it will activate that anointing. And I've seen it many times. When I look in and say, Lord, for your mercy sake, please. And the Lord said, it is done. Sometimes you have not even prayed. And say, it's done. And the person checks the pain is gone. The sickness is gone. Why? The mercy of God. So Jesus moved with compassion. Said to him, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I'm willing to be what cleans. The Bible says, as soon as he had spoken. As soon as he had spoken. Immediately the leprosy left him. And he was cleansed. Glory to God. Praise God. Compassion. The mercies of God. It's not only sinners that need mercy. You don't only need mercy when you have sinned. You need mercy for everything. You need mercy to meet needs for provision. You need mercy for everything. You need mercy to have access to life. Jesus raised the son of the widow of Nain because she obtained mercy from Jesus. Remember as Jesus was entering the city of Nain, the Bible says he saw a woman, a widow, Whose son was being carried for burial. That's the mercy of God. Restoring life. Pray to God for his mercies for healing. Is all you need to do. To assess or receive divine healing by mercy. Just cry to him for his mercy. And you see when it's by mercy. It doesn't really matter whether you are operating by faith or not. 
All you are counting on is the mercy of God. In the book of Psalm 6, verse 2, the Bible says, Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. Heal me, for my bones are troubled. Now listen, when you give your life to Christ, and you begin to build your walk with God, at some point, God will require faith from you. So there are certain things you will not be able to assess without faith. Even though you are trying for mercy. If there are things I learned in ministry the hard way. Many times when people just join the church, when they are sick, I don't need to ask them, do you believe? I just pray and God heals them. Why? It's mercy. There are troubles in their workplaces. I just pray for them and God heals them, intervene in their businesses, everything is going on well. But the time comes, God says, put that big baby down, let him walk with his legs. So he comes now and God says, ask him, do you believe? And God says, put him to fast and let us join faith together. So sometimes some persons are wondering and saying, What's happening is this, that pastor is displeased with me. Now you are saying, go and fast. Before you don't say fast, you just say, in the name of Jesus, it is done. So now I say, go and fast. Go and pray. Let us join faith together. Why? Because a time comes, my faith can no longer work for you. In the sense that you can no longer hop in on my faith. You have to use your own faith. The just shall be by his faith, not by his pastor's faith. But the challenge is that many give their life to Christ and do not spend time to build their work with God and develop their faith life. So they get to a point where miracles, divine intervention, play tools in their life. So friends, if you are born again and you are growing up, don't just say the mercy of God is enough. The mercy of God, yes, is enough, but God will require what? Your faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. He said, For without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to him must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently want to see him. The just shall live by his faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. So if you ask, you must ask in faith with no doubt. Remember James chapter 5, James chapter 1 from verse 5. If anyone lack wisdom, let him ask what? Let him ask in faith with no doubt and he will receive. He that doubt is like the wave of the sea that is tossed to and fro. He said, let not that man think that he will receive anything from the Lord. Praise God. Now the second method I want us to look at on receiving divine healing is true God's word. True God's word. Divine healing can also be received by intentionally engaging in the ministry of God's word. In the book of Psalm 107, verse 20, Psalm 107, verse 20, the Bible says, He sent His word and healed them, and delivered them from their destruction. So when God speaks, when God sends His word, when you study the word of God and the word of life, the spirit, not the letter, comes to you, it impacts healing to you. Uh, Prophet Elijah's first miracle occurred by the word of God. You remember the healing of the water and the ground? It did not occur by the salt, the use of the salt. Even though he said, bring me salt in a new bowl, and he cast the salt to the source of the water. It didn't occur by the salt. That was just an act of faith. That was just a sovereign act of God. What actually brought the healing was the word of God. Look 
at verse 22 of 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 22. It says, So the water remained healed to this day according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. When he said, Thus said God, I have healed you from today, there shall be no more death or barrenness from you. So when God sent forth his word, he heals and delivers from destruction. In like manner, when you assess the word of God, you will obtain healing and deliverance. Glory to God. So when you fail to receive healing by the mercy of God, plug into the word of God. So open the scriptures and give yourself intentionally to the ministry of the word. The word will always work. The word never fails. God will always honor his word. In Isaiah chapter 55 from verse 10 to 11, it says, even as the rain comes upon the earth, even the snow and does not return either, the wet the earth and make it boo that it may give seed to the, the, the eater and bread of the soil. It says, so shall the word be that proceeds out of my mouth. It shall not return void unto me. It shall accomplish that which I have spoken it, and it shall prosper in that which I what has sent it. Glory to God. So to do this, the study, meditation, and confession of God's word is the key to receiving divine healing through God's word. And I'd like to read from the Amplified Version, the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, from verse 20 to 21. Proverbs 4, from verse 20 to 22. Now listen carefully. Proverbs 4, verse 20 to 22 from Amplified Version. It says, My son, attend to my words. Consent and submit to my saying. If God's word is going to produce healing in your life, you must consent. You must agree to what he said. You can't be happy with the word of God and it will be imparting healing to you. You can't be questioning the word of God and it will be imparting healing and deliverance to you. That's why many study the Bible and it brings no profit to them. God said what he meant and meant what he said. And every time you read the Bible, it's God speaking to you. So don't wait for one I am God that will shake your whole house. Praise the Lord. Now, over 20 years of ministry, I've only heard audible voice once. Once. So don't expect a voice from heaven. The word is always with you. Accept it as the word of God. Whether it's Old Testament or New Testament. You can't take away the Old Testament and you take account of creation away. And you take God's dealing with the children of Israel with men away. When the Bible talks about the law, it's not the whole Old Testament that is the law. It is just some portions of rules and regulations that was given. So the Old Testament is not the law. Why do you still claim Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. Why do you still claim Isaiah 54, verse 17, no weapon formed against you will prosper? It's not in the New Testament. Take the whole word as truth and agree with the word of God and submit to it. Now verse 21 says, let them not depart from your sight. Keep them in the center of your heart. Study the word, meditate in the word. It says in verse 22, for they are life. To those who find them. Remember what Jesus said in John 6, 63. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits not in the words that I speak unto you. They are what? They are spirit and they are life. So he says the word is life. In that letter, healing is life. And when you focus on the letter of the word and you start studying and you start meditating in that letter, suddenly it will open up to you. And the life of the word will come. The revelation of the word will come. The realm of the word will come. 
and impact you and healing and deliverance will take place. Reverend Hagen received divine healing through the word of God. He was best bed fast for 16 months. He was deformed. He had a deformed heart, an incurable blood disease. And could only just lie down for 16 months. And as he began to study the world, learn about what God has said concerning divine healing. Eventually, after he stumbled and stumbled on doubt, on fear, on discouragement, because in their days, divine healing was considered a forgotten thing. It was no longer God's will to heal in their days. The knowledge of divine healing was very scarce. So that when he eventually believed that God wants him to receive the divine healing and it was God's will to, for him to be healed and he could be healed, he stumbled by the book of Mark chapter 11, verse 24. That was what brought him out of the sick bed. I showed you, I said unto you, whatsoever you ask when you pray, believe that you will receive and you shall what? Have it. And he said, he believed he had received. He believed he was healed. And the Spirit of God said to him, if you are healed, then get off the bed. And he made an attempt to stand up, but he fell down. And then he mustered his strength, held the bunk of the bed, and stood up and raised himself. And lifted up his hand and announced before heaven and earth and said, I've been healed. And he said, the power of God like oil came upon him. And the sickness left. He was made perfectly whole. In those days, they used to call him a living skeleton. Because it was very thin. But within a few months, the flesh came up. Hallelujah. And he was totally restored. He assessed it by the word of God. Another woman who was an unbeliever was given up for the dead. And there's this staff of Reverend Hagen who went visiting. The woman lived a worldly life, wayward life, who always cost people when they want to preach to her. And so this woman went to preach to her and just read that same scripture. She had terminal cancer, had been given up for the dead. When the scripture was read, she said, is that in the Bible? The woman said, yes, it's in the Bible. She said, bring it, let me see. She read it. I showed me, I said unto you, whatsoever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive it and you shall have it. She said, I'm healed. Instantly she got healed. Yeah. Hallelujah. And then she gave her life to Christ. Healing, divine healing, can be assessed through the word of God. Now the remaining part of verse 22 says, it says, for they are alive to those who find them, Healing and health to all their flesh. Healing and health to all their flesh. So each time you study the word, you're taking in life. You're taking in healing. You're taking in health. It does not matter what's wrong with your body. As long as the word gets into you, life will come into you. Healing will come into you. Health will come into you. That's why he says, give attention to the word. Attend to the word. Agree with the word. And Jesus commanded us to teach the word. You can't teach what you've not studied. God told Joshua, he said, this book of the law in Joshua 1, it shall not depart out of your mouth, it shall meditate during day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. In so doing, you make your way prosperous, and you have what? Good success. So if you meditate daily, so that you can observe to do. You have prosperity and good success. Praise God. Hallelujah. So apart from you assessing the word of healing yourself, just by the utterance of a word of healing from an anointed servant of God, you can be healed. You remember that centurion went to Jesus and said, only speak a word 
and my servant shall be what? Made whole. Matthew chapter 8, verse 8. Only speak a word, and my servant shall be made whole. And Jesus said, Go as you have believed, so be what? Done to you. By the time he got home, his servant was what? Was healed. Praise God. Talk me, and I'll stop on this note. The top method for receiving divine healing is through the prayer of faith. Through what? The prayer of faith. So if you don't access divine healing through the mercies of God or through the word of God, you can through the prayer of faith. It seems to me that God wants everybody to be healed, so he made methods available to assess divine healing. You can assess divine healing through the demonstration of the Spirit, the manifestation of the Spirit. Gifts of the Spirit have been to services and just announced by gift of word of knowledge and healing and without touching or praying for the people to get healed. Through the anointing, we worship and the anointing comes down, people receive their healing. Several better true communion. You partake of the communion, you get healed. True sovereign move of God, the power of God just invade the place, people get healed. But let's look at the prayer of it. James chapter 5, verse 14 to 16. James chapter 5, verse 14 to 16. He says, Is anyone among you sick? He's talking to believers. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. He says, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. Not the anointing oil. The prayer of faith. Now, that does not mean you can anoint people with oil and without praying for them, God can heal them. He can. In fact, there was somebody who had uh, kidney issues and this was in Benin. Her legs were swollen, she couldn't stand, they were holding her. I prayed for her, nothing happened. And the Lord said to me, put your, your coat on her. And I did. In the service, in one of our miracle uh, uh, service, and she stood. But the following day when she came, the swollen leg had gone down, she was perfectly okay. Now, is it the coat that healed her? No, it's the power of God. So, but what we are focusing on here is not the all, it is the prayer of faith. And it's simply a prayer that is offered in faith. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he had committed sins, he will be forgiven. You see what I said earlier on, that sin opens the door to sinners. And by the time you look at verse 16, it says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Sin opens the door to sicknesses and diseases. And so because of the attacks of the enemy, it says, anointing with power. To bring a protective covering because the shepherd will anoint the sheep with oil so that insects and flies cannot ox them or pet on their wounds. It becomes a protective covering. That's the essence of the oil, basically. So then he says, the prayer of faith. So if anybody is sick, pray for the person. There was an elder in one of the churches that Reverend David pastor that fell ill. And his wife, after he couldn't receive healing, began to urge him to call for the pastor to pray for him. Now he had gotten into a quarrel with the elders and the pastor, and after that, he got sick. So but out of pride, he would not allow them to come pray for him. When it became clear he was going to die, he swallowed his pride and invited them to the house. And he hold up and said, please, I'm very sorry I have sinned. I've offended you people. Please forgive me. Now by this time, the hospital couldn't help him. He was dying. 
And they said, we also forgive you and we love you. And that was it. They took oil, anointed him and prayed for him and God healed him. A revival broke out. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. So when your faith seems not to be enough, join faith with others, call for the elders. Call for the pastors, call for other brethren. Let them join faith with you and just pray. And as they pray, believe you receive and you begin. It's as simple as that. Now on your own, you can receive divine healing by praying for yourself in faith. Remember what the Bible says in Mark 11 verse 24. Whatsoever you ask when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall what? You shall have it. Let me read from the Amplified Version. It says, for this reason I'm telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust, and be confident that it is granted to you, and you will get it. Hallelujah. That is granted to you, and you will what? You will get it. It's as simple as that. So if you need healing through any of these three means, you can receive it now. Through the mercy of God, through the word of God, and also through the prayer of faith. I'll look at the other methods later on. Then I want us to pray. Let's close our eyes to pray. One of the major entrants to divine healing is sin. Whether unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, any doubt, fear, hatred. Also mean that's the divine healing. I want you to pray and talk to God and ask Him for mercy. Ask Him for mercy. Ask Him for forgiveness.